Okay, so uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to be presenting this topic that I promised that I'd be addressing. It's a topic of great significance, but also considerable subtlety. It relates centrally to two major features that we've been discussing, two major features at the heart of this boot camp. To wit, complex systems, system science on the one hand, and data, and data regarding coming from complex systems, collected from complex systems. Because of the subtleties involved, I'm going to try to proceed uh, slowly in an introduction that discusses a set of foundational concepts. The most basic of which is probably something I've referred to at several times, which is the notion of a state space. Now we talk about state space of a model, but we can also think about state spaces of, of a system. And this is a fancy, it's not like a fancy term, but it's important to, to recognize that fundamentally what it's about is the set of all possible situations a system could be in, model by extension could be in, we think about a, a system, for example, associated with sitting, standing, lying down, active or not off person, that delineates the set of all possible states. That's the state space of that system. When we're dealing with, with systems which are continuous in nature, such as uh, that shown here, we have a far larger state space. We can have some number of people and clean past users, some number of people and no use with disorder, some number of people and never used with no chronic pain, etc. And we could imagine the system being in it and one of a wide, wide number of possible combinations, of different values for these different stocks. State spaces describe the sort of set of all possible situations in the model, okay? Um, and it turns out that if we have a model, it can, it can be a useful tool for depicting how the model's changing over time, okay? So if we have a model such as this, the simple SIR, susceptible infected recovered model, oh, excuse me, susceptible infected temporarily immune we could draw out a state space. And the state space would associate an axis, a dimension, with each of these states. So S, we might count the number of people here with S. This might be I along this axis. And this might be R along this axis excuse me, temporarily immune along this axis. So each of these stocks, this one, that one, that one, will be associated with the dimension. And at any one time, the model has a certain value for each of these stocks. And so within state space, it's at a certain point. Maybe initially it is almost all susceptibles, very few infectives and very few temporarily immune people. In other words, Almost everyone is here, maybe one or two people here and no one here, then it would be in this state over here. We have a large S, no I, and very low TI. And then perhaps over time as it evolves, as we run this model, things evolve. Susceptible people get infected, for example, here. So this goes up while susceptible goes down. Well. We see that illustrated here. The number of susceptibles coming down, it's not immediately obvious because this is in 2D, 
um, it would be more obvious when you see it, ladies and gentlemen, in the oculus. So this S reduces, but the I increases. That's why this is kind of going over. It's kind of coming in like this and, 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 and moving over in a way that S is going down, I is going up. And meanwhile, the number of temporarily immune is rising too. And we could show an evolution of this system over time in a time behavior over time graph for the number of susceptible, infected, and temporarily immune people. But we could also show it in the state space. The state space here. At any one time, it's at a point, and it evolves over time. Now, it's not immediately obvious where time is here. It turns out time is transpiring as it's going along here. But there's no axis for time. Rather, the axes are for the three dimensions associated with set of possible states S, I, and T, I. And a given trajectory of the model will arc as a trajectory through state space. And this is an equilibrium. This is where the system gets into balance. Do you remember Xiao Yan's model? Remember she showed how system dynamics models with calibration it would go and then it would approach an equilibrium? That's what this is. It's an equilibrium. It comes to a place where it's in balance between S, I, and TI. The number of people getting newly infected is the same as the number of becoming newly susceptible. So this stock doesn't change. The number of getting newly infected is the same as new recovery. So this stock doesn't change. The number of new recovery is the same as newly susceptible. So this stock doesn't change. It approaches this point. This is this particular model. But this is for a model. There's I would argue that any system out there in the world, a person, um, an epidemiological sis, uh, situation, it has an underlying state space. There's some space of all possible situations. And over time, as it evolves, it goes through a trajectory in state space. Now, what's notable about this model is that this state space well, you look at it, and ostensibly it's in three dimensions. One dimension for S, for I, and for TI. In fact, it's, if you look at it from the side, it turns out to be two-dimensional. There's only, so it's all on a plane. It's not, it's, it's, it's not a three-dimensional structure. It's like a sheet of paper is two-dimensional, rather than, than occupying this entire area, there's, there's only two effective dimensions. And there's a reason for that, reflecting its structure. Can any of my students say why? Where is there a conservation here? What is, ch what is not changing over time? Well, the structure isn't changing. That's, that's true. But there's, uh, at a numeric level, there's also something that's unchanging. Yes, Paul. The total number of people. So if I know the total population and I know S and I, I can tell you what this is. It's just the total population minus that plus that. So there's fewer degrees of freedom, we would say, statistically, you know, in a situation like this. It actually is it's thinner. But this is an example of state space. And it, it um, has a smaller dimension that occupied than you would think. Okay. Um, I'm not going to go into this as much, but we can characterize system evolutions in, in spa state space. Um, okay. Now, once we've introduced the notion of state space, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about nonlinear systems. So, as I've argued, nonlinear systems are not simply strange, weird subclass of systems out there. Our challenges in the world in managing real world issues um, confront us and confound us in large part because we're working with nonlinear systems, systems which exhibit surprise behavior, which are not merely complicated but are technically complex. They can reach out and smack us in the face if we choose, in, uh, choose injudiciously. And choosing judiciously is very challenging without models to inform us. Um, 
And within these systems, um, typically they're tangled. So if we think about the opioid system as an example. Um, the number, number of calls for overdose responses, dispatch calls for, um, for constables, is tied up in a tangle with the prescribing policies for physicians. If, pres if physicians are very liberal in their dispensing of opioids for chronic pain, in a way that I'm told in Australia um, uh, has traditionally been, been frowned upon, um, with, with a corresponding lower burden of opioid dependence uh, within that continent. In, in, in our situation in Canada and the US, if a, if a physician gives out opioids for chronic pain um, in large numbers, police are gonna inherit some of the consequences potentially because of that and overdose responses. Um, the criminal justice system may, may inherit, may end up holding the bag for some of it, for the dealer related behavior that, that feeds this addiction, for the illegally sourced opioids, etc. Um, it's tangled up with what emergency room doctors have to deal with because they may deal with the effects of an overdose, etc. Similarly, we, we look at um, emergency department waiting times. You might think that, that they are, uh, if not totally straightforward, at least a local issue. They reflect things in the emergency room, but you'd be, you'd be very mistaken. Emergency room waiting times are not predominantly a measure just of how efficiently things are run in the emergency room. They depend on things far outside the emergency room. They depend on the number of individuals who not being able to get to a family physician go to the emergency room as a point of last resort. They reflect mental health issues in the community and the fact that individuals with mental health disorders all often end up presenting with the emergency room. They reflect social isolation and shut-ins in the community who might seek out uh, company for, to emerge from social isolation. But they also reflect the fact that the wards are often full and the, person, the people who are in the emergency rooms waiting for a bed can't get into a bed because the beds are full. Because Why are the beds full? Because people can't be discharged to the wards. Why can't they be discharged to the wards? Because the wards are full. And the wards are full because why? Because they can't be discharged to the community. Why? Because community services are not available or housing for the patients and aged care and long-term care facilities or, or personal care homes can't be found near the family uh, because the service coordination is not there for transportation or for support for, um, uh, for, for lung health issues, et cetera, that is needed by this particular patient. So what seems like a microcosm, um, you know, long waiting times in the ED, gets tangled up with other things through society, from mental health distress to issues of opioid addiction to issues associated with uh, the delivery of, of uh, care for complex patients to issues with service coordination in the community. When we're dealing with coupled systems, one parts of the system affects the others. This is an absolutely central point for what I'm gonna be discussing. It's absolutely foundational. And you know we see it in, in small models. I mean, right here, the number of the number of infectious people um, is not just some solitude that that proceeds independent of the others. The number of infectious people affects the number of susceptible people, and the number of susceptible people, in turn, through leading to new infections, affects the number of infectious people. And of course, the number of people losing their immunity is tied up with the number of temporarily immune people which inherits things from the infectious stuff. So a system like this is coupled, it's tangled. We have one piece like S tangled with each other piece. It's tangled with temporarily immune. And we live in a tangled society. We live in a tangled world. Not just because of local tangling, but 
with global air travel and breakdown of ecosystems due to development and spread of infectious diseases from them, et cetera. We're, we live in a tangled world. And this tangled world presents us with challenges of choosing judiciously our, our interventions, our policies. But it also presents us sometimes with opportunities for insight. And in fact, that's what we're going to be talking about for the balance of the day is how these tangled systems provide opportunities for insight. And the very entanglement can allow us to glean more insight from what ostensibly will be information about just one piece of the system, but will illumine in a way similar to a hologram the broader system. So the, the fact that an evolution of the variable in these systems will entangle to others actually has an implication informationally and in terms of insight. What it means is that if I have a factor uh, going on, let's say a long waiting time in the ED, that the information about how long people wait actually tells me something about the things that it depends on. It tells me often if I have a really long waiting time in the ED, it may hint to me that the beds in the wards must be really full, the wards being the hospital area outside of the ED. And you may say, well, why would it tell you that? Because one of the big reasons people back up in the ED is because they can't get discharged to the hospital. And the primary reason they can't get discharged is because the beds there are full. So what I see in the ED tells me something about what's going on out there. Again, I argue that people who are coming in a steady stream through this door, or, or in whole groups just rushing to the door, it would tell me something about what's going on out there. When you have coupling, it, it allows you to listen to one thing and know something about the other things that are coupled to it, okay? Um, and it turns out that this can be, can be demonstrated uh, mathematically. I show here, uh, for those who are, who are more technical in their orientation, and I won't dwell on this, I show here a classic system called predator-prey. And, um, and basically it depicts some number of prey and some number of predators that, that that consume that prey. And, and it turns out that the prey, because they're eaten by the predators, the, the rate of change of prey, whether rabbits are increasing quickly or going down a number, it, it depends a lot on how many predators there are. If there's lots of predators around, the rabbits are probably going to be dropping a number because they're being gobbled up. If there are few predators around, the rabbits will probably be multiplying at a high rate. Similarly, the number of predators, <coughs> because of factors related to their birth rate that are limited by how well nourished they are, if the number of predators is going up rapidly, it tells you something about the number of prey. It tells you there must be a lot of prey around. If the number of predators is dropping quickly, it says there must not be too plentiful prey. And it turns out you can show this in terms of the algebra. I won't show it here, but you can solve this variable for y in terms of x. And so what this is saying is you can figure out what y is doing knowing just about x in the parameters here. Knowing just about x, just about x, we could figure out what the value, knowing just about the number of prey, we could figure out what the number of predators should be right now. Knowing, by, when I say knowing about the prey, I'm talking about the rate of change of them as well as the number of them. Not just the count, but how, if they're going up or down. And similarly with predators. I won't dwell on this, but this is a profound thing. For those who want to learn more about this, this is very significant. What it tells us is, you know, when we have these coupled, tangled systems, if we know about one part, we know a lot about the other parts too. Because, you know, they're, they're coupled together, much as you know, the fact that 
we have a phone line from A to B allows the person in A to pick up the phone and the person in B to hear, hear it. That coupling leads to the ability to, to know something about what's going on the other, other side, okay? Um, I would argue it's similar with, with West Nile. We have a quite articulated West Nile model to which I've made, I've made reference. It consists of mosquitoes and people and birds, and perhaps soon. With some, um, uh, with with some collaborations uh, of interest in mind, uh, maybe we can incorporate veterinary components in it as well. But this is a coupled system. If we start to see a large number of human cases emerge, we see acute flaccid paralysis and in, uh, encephalopathy cases. It tells us something about. There's probably a lot of infectious mosquitoes around. Critically, for Dan's interests in mind, if we start to see lots of equine cases, cases among horses, it probably tells us that the mosquito population is quite infected and humans may be at risk. We have a coupled system. Knowing about one part tells us about the other part trying to drive home this basic intuition of what otherwise could seem an outrageous fact. Okay? Um, secondly, um, this point holds true for data um, as well. So if we have data over time on the number of equine cases, It'll tell us what something, it'll hint to us, it'll whisper to us something about the number of mosquitoes that are infected there. Um, might not be an immediate connection. Maybe it'll be a while after the mosquito population gets highly infected before we start seeing the equine cases. But once we start seeing the equine cases, it's probably an indication that mosquito cases have been infected for a while. It's been quite a a number of, 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 uh, of mosquitoes infected for a while, okay? Um, this is true for models. This is true for the real world. When we have entanglement of the sorts, it, it means that one parts of the system, that what we see in one part of the system encodes information about other parts of the system. I, I emphasize this word encode information because it may not be immediately obvious how to read it out of it, but it's there. It, there's some, there's something uh, that it that it is telling us about this uh, this other part of the system. If only we could learn to read it, and today we will learn to read it. Okay, um, so if we have a variable from the world that's taken over time, we can use it to learn about other things in the world. And in the, I thought it was the 70s, but in fact it was the 80s, um, uh, that Floris Taken, a mathematician um, of, of some note, um, demonstrated that this is in fact provably the case that if you have a complex system of, of rather with rather modest assumptions associated with it. It doesn't require um, anything uh, too strong in terms of assumptions. Um, you can actually have, go through a structured process, a defined process, which is quite mechanical in nature, to learn about the broader system of which this is part. So in other words, given a, a set of observations from one part of, the, of a coupled system, let's say for the emergency room waiting times, by putting that data into um, uh, a certain mathematical crank, so to speak, put it into a certain mathematical transformation, say data every 15 minutes from waiting times in the uh, ED, we could apply a certain mathematical transformation, turn the crank, turn the crank, and you will get out a picture 
not just of one other piece of the system. You will get out a picture of the underlying state space of the system, the underlying evolution of the system as a whole. Because that one piece encodes information about these other pieces of the system. And what is remarkable, moreover, is that this, this mechanical process you go through to give you this picture of the broader system and its dynamics over time, this mechanical transformation, this lens that we use, is very straightforward to apply. And it depends on something called delay embedding. Delay embedding. Okay? So, suppose that we have a system that is, that has a set of observations from the world that we'll denote as Y. And we'll put y in these kind of square brackets, t, meaning the value of y at t for this one observation over time. So we'll have a y of 0, and a y of 1, and a y of 2, and a y of 3, and a y of 4, y of 5. And, and those, will, those are successive values of this time series. Maybe it's the number of people waiting in the emergency room every 15 minutes. Y of zero is the number of people waiting in the emergency room January 1st at midnight at the start of the new year. And Y of one is the number of people waiting in the emergency room at RUH at 15 minutes past midnight on January 1st. Y of two is the number of people waiting uh, in the emergency room at 30 minutes past midnight on January 1st. And it just goes on and on, right? Um, alternatively, maybe it's the number of equine cases recorded on a per day basis diagnosed with West Nile day by day by day in succession. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's what we want. So if we have, if we have such a system, it turns out that we can engage in a process called embedding. This is our lens. This is our transformation of which I spoke. We can take each value in there. Let's suppose y of 10, you know, which is a few hours past midnight. And we can construct a space much like those spaces we depicted earlier. Ooh, much like these spaces, um, which will look interesting yet. It's a space in the sense that it has several dimensions. Let's say three dimensions, okay, for now. Because it's easier to talk about three than four. Okay? Um, and as you'll see with the Oculus, it'll be easy to explore through. Okay? So we'll say three, three dimensions. And each point in here can be represented in what's called a vector. It's, it's represented by an x-coordinate, a y-coordinate, a z-coordinate. Okay? It's, it has three elements. One to specify how far along this axis, along that axis, and along that axis. Right? X, Y, Z. Yep. Okay. Um, so here we will calculate vectors with those three components. So this might be, for example, y of 10, y of 10 minus 1, and y of 10 minus 2. In other words, well, if one vector that's y of 10, another is, and, and, and uh, its first element along this direction maybe is, is uh, whatever value is measured at y of 10, and this one is y of 9, and this one is y of 8, okay? So from this time series, we could go through this. We could basically list, take those original ones and put them into to vectors uh, of length, in this case, three. Mm -hmm. um, and we can choose a tau. I mentioned a tau of one. So, so here, these would actually be like y of 10, y of 9, y of 8, 
or wife 100, wife 99, wife 98, or maybe this is wife 2, wife 1, and wife 0. Um, but there are successive vectors. Um, there are vectors whose successive elements were actually drawn from neighboring elements in the original time series. Alternatively, maybe, maybe tau is 10, in which case so this would be y of 100, this would be y of 90, so it's 100 minus 10, or 90, and this would be y of 100 minus 2 times 10, or 80. We can imagine these vectors, and we can imagine plotting those vectors in a space of size 3. There are three vectors, the vectors of length 3, so we can put them into a space of, like, of, of, of length 3. Hmm? So we're creating vectors of evenly spaced observations where the spacing is as delta. And we, we populate it. And we get out something like that. We get out something like that, which is recommended by beauty as well as by coolness, <laughs> as well as by utility, OK? So the idea is we have a time series, ladies and gentlemen, and we take this time series and we put it into vectors and we plot those vectors. That's what these are. And in fact, these different colors, I believe, represent successive points. So those with nearby colors or from nearby points. You can see they're, they're a given place here will be populated by ones from many different times. But this is what pops out of the time series when you plot plop that down. A time series which may not look like you have any obvious patterns and you put it in and, and out comes something like this. This is just different three-dimensional reconstructions rotated around. These are two-dimensional reconstructions here. Um, this is an example time series. Take a look at that. Looks to all the world perhaps like it's a random time series. Mm -hmm. There we go. X. But you plop it down into, you go through this procedure, you create these vectors of length 3, and you end up putting out something like that. You get something like this out. You plot it out. Okay? Um, plot it out. This is the value of x versus the previous value. And you can see here, this is, this is the amazing thing. This is the amazing thing. Here, there may be no obvious pattern to this. I mean, it, there's something there, but the regularities are not obvious. The order of it is not obvious. There's, it's not obvious what the pattern is. If you ask me to predict what comes next after this, I'd be, I'd be dumbstruck. I'd be flummoxed. I'd, I, I, I wouldn't be able to give you a good answer. What comes next after this? It, it, looks, it looks unpredictable or, or, you know, there's no clear order. I'm talking about this time series here. But if we put it into one of these, if we go through that little procedure here, um, ooh, oh, ooh, 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 okay, okay, well, if we put it through that procedure in 2D, we get these things out. In 3D, we get this out. Is there structure there? Is there order there? You bet there's order, there's structure. This looks kind of random. It's not quite random. It's actually technically it's something called chaotic. But, but there's a hidden order. And the order is revealed by engo engaging in this embedding. Now, this poses an interesting opportunity. Because this order, this, this regularity that we see captured from what otherwise looks irregular, looks disordered, this regularity that we capture is not just a pretty thing. Although I will admit, it's a very pretty thing. It's very nice. And, and these ones, these, these are, by the way, from um, quite nice data sets. Um, these are also very nice. Don't you agree? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's cool. Um, but ladies and gentlemen, 
not only is it interesting and beautiful, it is super useful. Because what this is showing is actually not an arbitrary object of, of beautiful proportion. What it's actually showing is the structure of the underlying mathematical system that gives rise to it. It's not just some weird, wild, nerdy shape, although it is most probably that. It is, it is telling us about the underlying structure of the system that gives rise to it. Okay. So we are reconstructing the state space of the system. If we created a model of this system and we had multiple variables, much as we did back here with SI and TI, we could plot out state space, much as we started to, out of these variables. We could plot out the state space and see its structure. But I would tell you that we could find the same basic picture by examining data from any one of these over time, like I, alone, going through this reconstruction process that I just described, and we would get something that's basically this, from one of these variables alone. How could that be? How could it be that if we plot out S, I, and R, along x, y, and z axes, and we plot that out from this system, that we get nothing more than we get from any one of them in isolation going through this process. Ah, it's because it's a tangled coupled system. It's because I tells us a lot about what's going on in ti and s. Any one of them knows about the others. Any one of them knows more than any one about the others. It's the dynamics in any one of them influence the others. And so there's encoded information there. And so what is being reconstructed here is not just a beautiful shape, although it is most definitively that. It is a beautiful shape. But it is more than that. It is peering into the window of the system that gives rise to this. It is telling you about the mathematical structure of the system that is producing this. Even and most emphatically, especially those parts of the system which we do not have information on directly. Maybe all we have information on here is the number of new infections. And just that little bit, Ladies and gentlemen, just that little bit reveals to us the underlying system as a whole. <laughs> because it is a coupled system. Because it is entangled. Because these ones here, I and TI and S, write their patterns upon the, the fluctuations of new infections because new infections whispers to us of each of these other pieces of the, of the system. Now you could say, well, this is a model. Does this reconstruction depend on the model? No, it does not depend on the model. We can take data from the world. And more than that, ladies and gentlemen, we do take data in our lab from the world and re reconstruct these pictures. And they tell us about the system that gives rise to it. But they will show us something even more powerful soon as well, or equally powerful. They will tell us what is driving what, what is causally coupled to what. So this is a astounding result. And this is why one of the reasons why people talk about complexity theory or chaos theory being the science of seeing hidden order in things that otherwise seem disordered. That looks disordered, there's a hidden order there. There's a hidden regularity there, if we can only recognize it. But it's not just that there's an order there. The order that's there, is, it shows how the system is being generated. It tells you how complex it is and what factors involve feedbacks, etc. Okay, um, 
So we've built systems that allow us to show this from data, okay? So we take data and we reconstruct state spaces from this. This is um, some of the, the types of data we reconstruct. This is from physiological measurements, as, as, as I recall. And you can re reconstruct, uh, reconstruct systems from it. Some of them are intriguing and they demonstrate feedbacks where they've only been hypothesized, et cetera. Um, okay, so this is delay, it's called delay embedding. Why delay? Because we have this, this is called the delay tau. We, we, we put in these vectors 10 and 9 and 8 or 10 and 8 and 6 or 10 and, and 7 and, and 4, et cetera. Tau, just choosing different values of tau will, will allow you to, to have different embeddings. Now, the choice of tau does matter. Um, so, so, oh, I'm so happy to be able to present this. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, tau, the choice of tau is not entirely arbitrary in terms of visualization. At a mathematical level, it's somewhat arbitrary because it just leads to more squishing, um, but something that's that still demonstrably retains the same squished shape. But here, tau is useful for visualization to think about tau. So bigger taus, if, if you have something that's, that's sampled finally, let's suppose we had ED wait times data every minute, and we only had a tau of one. What we would see is, if we were to embed this, we would tend to see tend to see values here, here, and here. If tau is one minute, we would, you know, so, so we're getting it every minute and tau is one, we would see values like at 110, 109, 108, which would tend to be very similar in value. And that will lead it to be a line of diagonal because the x-axis, the y-axis, and the z-axis are basically the same value. So it, it tends to make it kind of squished along the diagonal if these are measured frequently. Um, so in other words, if, if, if we're measuring a system frequently, so the values are pretty similar at neighboring points and tau is very small, because we put them in a vector, remember this is the x-axis of the vector, the y-axis and z-axis, this is a three-dimensional vector, the values tend to be very, very similar. This is the value at 110 p.m., 109, 108, so the value at 1 at 110 is, say, uh, for one of these, it might be 1 at 110, 1 at 109, 108. And it's right along the diagonal. Do you understand that? Do you, do you get that point? Why it's the values of each are just about equal. But take a look. As you expand tau, you get this progressive expansion of this. And, and then you start to see this larger structure. Um, unfold. That structure is embedded in here. Um, it's sort of squished into it. But here you see it, you see it in more uh, fulsome, blooming character. Rifat, as an artist, you may get some ideas from these, I would, I would imagine. Um, uh, we, we could inspire you with state space reconstructions. Um, here's another one. So this is from the so-called Lorenz attractor, this guy here. And take a look at this. You go from this with tau equal one, this is tau equals two, tau equals three, tau equals four. Um, this is not finally, this is not finally sampled. And as a result, you tend to, to not benefit a lot in unsqueezing it. Instead, these are already far enough sampled away and over time, you can end up getting these kind of more, more somewhat more complex, uh, complex patterns, which are still embedded in each other. It's just, it, it does bring out some features of it. Okay, so why do we do this reconstruction? I mean, why do this? Yeah, it's pretty. It's interesting. And for real world data sets, it's pretty interesting what you see in these patterns. Do it for Ethica data, do it for data from uh, measles counts. Um, it's, it's quite neat. Do it for weather data from Saskatoon. Talk about complexity. Um, 
It's, it's very interesting. Um, well, why do we do it? Well, you can recognize the hidden structure, the order uh, behind there. You can actually assess dimensionality of this structure, which will turn to be useful. It turns out you can use this to predict forward what's likely to happen. So in terms of predictive analytics, it's kind of weak compared to what you can do with particle filtering because it doesn't capture the mechanism, but people do try to use it to predict um, on the basis of this one data point. Um, but the one we're going to be focusing on today is this last one. You can use it to assess which variable is driving what variable and how strongly. Are two variables just correlated or are they causally entwined? Does one drive, does A drive B or B drive A or both? These are things you could figure out from this. Does anyone else feel that vibration? Yes. What is that from? I, I've encountered it several times and I'm absolutely fascinated. You can feel it better than us because we're sitting. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's very strong. It's happened Yeah, I particularly wonder you know, what might be going on in that room. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, yeah, okay. So ladies and gentlemen, our focus here is gonna be this last one. This is great stuff. And by the way, Dorian, as he brings the Oculus, he will be bringing you your doorway into this world. Because his software is set to visualize this in three dimensions from real world data sets. And he will walk you through how you can read in those data sets and interact with these, um, with these depictions of the hidden order behind those data sets, okay? Um, okay, but our focus today is going to be this last one. Yeah, it's really, it's really a shaken up here. Um, okay, um, so convergent cross mapping is the focus, is our quarry now. So convergent cross mapping is a technique that takes advantage of what we just spoke about. It takes advantage of the fact that a given time series whispers to you about the things that affect it. Let me rephrase that one more time to emphasize a point. A time series from a couple nonlinear system which surround us and which are the things against which we or with which we struggle because they have surprising behavior. Within those systems, a given time series collected systematically over time whispers to you, I said about the things that affect it, but I want to sharpen that point, about the things that causally drive it. It tells you about these things that are causally influencing. And that bit of understanding will carry you through an understanding of conversion process, how it works. A given time series, because it encodes this information about things that causally, causally influence, it allows us to reconstruct the system, including those things, so including information about those things. And Convergent cross mapping takes advantage of that. It will allow you to take two time series collected systematically over time at the same points in time, contemporaneously. Call them X and Y. And it will tell you does a causal relationship exist by which X drives Y, Y drives X x and y drive each other or is there no correlate or there's no causation between them i want to emphasize causal here this is not about correlation x and y may be very 
highly correlated. But they don't, may not be causally driven. They might be driven by a third factor that drives both of them. But they don't drive each other. This provides a way of distinguishing that from causal linkage between them. And that's very important. We'll see quite a few examples of that. And it allows you to determine the strength of such relationship with a star because we have to also make note that it's affected by the length of the series that we have and the noise. Okay. Um, so how does this work? Well, the good news is that the way in which it works is exactly what we've been talking about. From each time series, it reconstructs the space. It reconstructs the so-called shadow manifold. And ladies and gentlemen, when it comes to causation, the shadow knows. I'm not sure the young people get that. Um, the shadow knows. The shadow manifold we reconstruct from each one, that will be the core, OK? And I want to I want to try to communicate this intuition because it's slippery. But if variable y is influence of variable x, when we can reconstruct the shadow manifold for x, it's gonna it's gonna encode information about y. It's, it, it's, if it's being driven by y, y will be represented in the state space reconstructed from it because. It's reconstructing the state space of the things driving it. So Y will be, will be captured within that state space. It'll be like a dimension of that state space. And that's going to allow us to determine if they are, in fact, causally connected. So the basic idea here is that we're going to create to see if, if y is driving x, we're going to create the shadow man manifold for x. We're going we're to take x and we're going to reconstruct this. We're going we're to take x's elements. Oh, we're going to take x's elements. We're going to put them into these vectors and plot them out just like that. Just like that. And then we're going to see the degree to which closeness of that shadow manifold predicts, predicts closeness in the value of y. Um, so correlation between the reconstructed values of y for, for sort of close points in space. Because if x encodes y, the y's from nearby areas will be close together and Closeness in the state space will mean closeness in value of y. That's really the nub of it. And we're going to see it played out. Okay, so here's a nice little time series put out before you. And there's the underlying shadow manifold reconstructed from it. And I would just note that in this shadow manifold that we've reconstructed, remember, this is for each point in x. We're going to read out the value of x at that point. Value of x, say, at tau is 1, the previous point, and x at the point 2, and the, and the value of x at two points back, and we're going to plot it out. That's what these points are in space. That's what these guys are here, OK? And if we consider a single such point, say that red point, which glows at us even yet in a Rudolphian way, we can find nearby points to it within this space. Okay? We're going to find the points within the other points from that time series that lie nearby. Now, those points need not be at from similar points in time. They're just points in terms of their locations within the state space that are, that are, are, are similar. So they have, they have similar values of, of uh, x and x minus 1 and x minus 2. But 
or X uh, now and, and one time ago and two times ago, but they could be from other times T. And maybe the system is looping around. Think about weather in Saskatoon, year in, year out, or think about patterns associated with, um, uh, with uh, distress on the part of a person uh, coming up um, on, an, uh, on a regular basis. We might see nearby points from many different points in time, but they're similar in terms of where they are in this space, in the sense that the current value and the previous value and the value two times ago are all in, in sort of similar areas. So these, these, these uh, points are from similar points, not in time, but in, in state space. The, the underlying state of the system is going to be similar at those points can be similar at those points with respect to things driving X is the idea. So, so over time, we've taken this time series, we've reconstructed a state space from it, and now we have taken where we're considering things nearby in state space. Those things are nearby in the state of the system that drives X. They're not necessarily nearby in time. Do you appreciate that? So there might be many points along here where we have a similar, similar point in state space. For example, I would argue this might be quite similar to what we see here and quite similar to what we see here. Those points in state space would probably be nearby. They're from different points in time, maybe this one as well, but they're going to be located similarly in state space. They're going to be li similarly located because x is going to be similar here and then x minus 1 and x minus 2 is going to be similar for these so they're going to they're going to end up these different ones here and here and here and here are going to end up nearby in state space do, do you appreciate that are those nearby in time no they're not nearby in time at all long gaps sometimes between them, but they're going to be in similar points in state space. Will you grant me that? Okay, great. I appreciate it. Soon you will be granted lunch. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Now, what we're going to do here is we're going to ask do those nearby points if I look at the value of, of y, of another time series, if I, if I, this is for x. And if I want to know, is, is another time series, the variable associated with another time series, y, either directly or indirectly driving x? Is it driving it? Is it causally influencing it? Not merely correlated. That, I don't really care about it. I want to know, is it driving it? Is it causally implicated in the changes of X? What I can do is the following. This is the core insight. Boy, do I wish I had someone who could explain this to me when I was there. Okay, when, if I want to know, does, is Y driving it? What I can do is, is I can say, okay, what's the value of y at that red point? And, and to what degree are the values of y at these nearby points, the average values of y at these nearby points, close to the value of y at the, at the, at the red point? And, 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 and follow my reasoning. Follow my reasoning. You may say, well, why would that tell you anything? What, why, should I, why should I care about whether they have similar values of y? You might say, well, look, they're from nearby points in time, so of course they're going to have similar values of y to red. No, they're not from nearby points in time. These nearby points, these green ones, are not from nearby points in time necessarily, from many scattered points in time. So, so you can't say, well, they're going to be close because y at, near, at that point in time is similar. No, it's not the case. When would they be close. Well, look, ladies and gentlemen, if y, if y is driving x, if y is causally determining it, 
Y is, is pushing X, it's governing it. If it's contributing to it, it's causally implicated pushing it. Then when we reconstruct X in this way, we know from Taken's theorem, we're reconstructing the state space of the system that's driving X. We're reconstructing the sort of the full state space of the system. That's what I argued later, that uh, earlier, that's driving X. We're reconstructing all different variables that are reconstructing, uh, that are driving X. And if that's the case, there's, there's a dimension, you could think of it for Y here, because it will need to construct the state of Y as part of this. If Y is driving X, that will have to be reconstructed as part of this state space. And things that are therefore close in state space should be close in Y. Mm -hmm. Because the state space is encoding Y. Things that are nearby have nearby values of Y. That's all part of the, the, the state space if Y is driving X. So if Y is driving X, these nearby points, these nearby nearby green points to, to the red point there should have nearby values of Y, because by definition, we're captured a state space, and the state space embodies Y, it captures Y, and so therefore nearby things in that state space should have nearby values of Y. Now if Y is not driving X, um, then there's, there's no particular relationship in terms of being nearby in state space here and the values of, of Y. Y is, um, is not causally a, a component of this. Um, at these very different points in time represented by the green elements, Y could carry on very different values because it's, 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 it's not a, a, a driving component here. And, and uh, it therefore needn't have very similar values to this red point. Now, there's a, there's a subtlety that, I'm, that some of you may be wondering about, and that is the next step in this explanation. And I'm watching the food. I'll mention it, but we'll talk about it more after the break. Suppose Y is highly correlated with X. Suppose it's it, it's, it's not that it's driving X, but it's highly correlated with X. Maybe there's another variable, Z, that drives both X and Y. And Z is, is, is associated with X, and Z is associated with Y. Therefore, X is going to be associated with Y, even though Y is not driving X. Well, in that case, we will have some signature of that association when we have nearby values in X, we'll have some nearby values of Y. But what will be different is as, as we add in successive points within this reconstructed state space, as we go from very few points to very large number of points, will be how the way in which we see the correlation change between these surrounding points um, and, and the value at, at the red one with respect to Y. So it turns out if there's merely correlation, we're gonna see a very different pattern for how that changes than if there's a causal relationship between them. If there's a causal relationship, we will see an ongoing rise in the the correlation between the average Y of these surrounding green points and the red dot, whereas if there's merely a correlation, we're not going to see that, that rise. We will see a sort of average correlation value that does not rise in this sort of continuous way with uh, the number of points within it. I'll leave that till after lunch, but um, we're going to see essentially we can use this reconstructive reasoning to figure out if Y is driving X causally on the basis of these manifolds, okay? So uh, it's, tw it's just past 12. Uh, Christine, is that lunch? That is lunch. Okay, okay, so uh, we'll break for an hour for lunch and then we will talk about applications of this further. 
and we're going to look at a bunch of different cases and look at their signatures when it comes to seeing signs of causality and see how it differs for a causal connection and for an a-causal connection, okay? So that's, that's what we'll be doing after lunch for different cases of causal dependence and correlation. Thanks very much, and we'll resume in an hour.